first JAWS JS tutorial video. Now I'm starting with showing you what it looks like within the NetBeans IDE. You can of course use anything you like to develop JavaScript, be it Notepad++, Sublime Text Editor, whatever works for you. I happen to like NetBeans, so I'm going to be using that to walk you through how to use JAWS JS. Now I'm starting with a look on index HTML. And the reason why I'm doing that, because I want to point out that JAWS JS uses the canvas element. That is where the drawing will take place for the game. Notice that I've already predefined that it has a width of 500 pixels and a height of 500 pixels. I'm also loading the memified version of JAWS. That's what this line is, the script include and also separating the game logic into a separate file, game.js. Now moving over to look at this, you'll notice I have the play state function. You can name your states, whatever you would like to. I find it convenient to name them as what they're going to be used for, a menu state, a play state to help you separate the logic into different states so those states can handle drawing input or whatever else you would have them use. Within a play state, as JAWS understands it, it looks for three properties, three functions. A setup, an update, and a draw. Now these are executed in a very specific order. Setup gets run one time, the initial setup for the state. Then, during a game loop, update and draw are run in that order continuously. Update will get called first, and then draw will get called second. Now, the reason why this is important is you can place anything you're going to update on the screen within the update function, and then have draw well, draw whatever you want it to. Now in this example, you'll notice I have two variables outside of the setup function. The reason why this is important is because of function scope. What you want to happen is for the variable player and goal in this case to be available within the scope of the function play state, but not necessarily exclusively defined with, within the smaller functions. Now that's kind of complicated if you're not familiar with this. But what it basically means is you will define anything you want to be set up, update, and drawn outside of those functions so all of those functions can access it. Now let's cover the setup function. As I mentioned before, it will get run one time. Notice that I'm initializing the player variable to be a new jaw sprite of the color red and at the position 2020 of a width 20 and a height 20. Now, if you're not familiar with how the coordinate system works within graphic libraries, it's that the upper left hand corner is the origin, the zero zero. The lower right hand corner is x plus n y plus n, basically as far as your screen will stretch. So 2020 is actually closer to the upper left hand corner and 8080, the position of the goal variable, is slightly more along a diagonal. Now notice that both player and goal are sprites. A sprite if you're not familiar with the term, is sort of a way to look at a slice of screen space. It's usually an image or some part of an image, something you're going to draw. In this case, I've defined it to be a square player of the color red and goal, also a square, to be the color blue within the setup function. Now moving to the update function, we see I'm doing something interesting here. I have player.setColor 
red. Now what this is doing here is each time update is being run before drawn gets called is it's setting the player variable, the player sprite, to be the color red, as I've already defined it initially during setup. I'm also doing four things here. I'm checking for up, left, down, and right. If the engine, JAWS, detects that I've pressed the up arrow, the Y coordinate of player gets subtracted 4 from its current position. That's the minus equals 4. The same with left, and the same with down, and the same with right. Now that may look a little confusing, but if you remember, the origin, the 0, 0, is in the upper left. So up is actually a negative action, and the same with left. We're subtracting to move left or up, and we're adding to move down or right. Now the other thing I'm doing here is I'm checking for collision. A collision happens within the JAWS engine when the rectangular dimensions of a sprite or other object overlaps with the rectangular dimensions of another object or sprite. Now I'm using collide one with one. This is a very specific function within JAWS that checks for one sprite or object overlapping with another sprite or object, and it returns true if they are and false if they aren't. So this conditional, this if statement, is checking to see if player is overlapping with goal. If it is, player is to set the color to green. Now that may seem odd comparing it to this earlier line player that set color red. But remember it's update is getting called before draw is getting called and it runs execution wise top to bottom. So player may initially be set to red but at the bottom of the execution of update if it is colliding with goal its color will be set to green. Now moving on to this draw function, we see two important things going on here. One is this line, jaws that clear, that will clear the drawing surface, sort of blinking the canvas, before anything else goes on. Then we call players draw loop, which, because it is a sprite, has its own separate drawing function, and goal, since it is a sprite, we also call its draw function. The order in which we call these is also important. You can create the effect of a Z layer along with a X and Y coordinate. You can stack sprites, presenting them as if they are closer to or away from the player's perspective on the screen. I'll go into that in a later video. Now the other thing going on here is I've associated an anonymous function, a function without a name, to be associated with the JAWS on load property. As soon as JAWS is ready, as soon as it is loaded, I want to tell it to do something. In this case, to start the play state function. Once JAWS is ready, it will call start on a state, in this case the function play state, and then it will start the game loop. In action, it looks like this. We have a canvas element on a blank page loaded within Firefox. We have the red player sprite at 2020 within the canvas element, not necessarily on the page. And we have the goal sprite, the blue sprite, at 8080 within the canvas element. Pressing the arrow keys, 
I can move the player sprite up, down, left, and right. But notice if the player square overlaps with the goal square, it becomes green. It is now colliding with the goal square. See how it's either red or when colliding green. Coming back to the source, we see that that is what I just went over. When it collides, it's set to green. Otherwise, it's set to red. Notice also that it appeared as if the player square, when green, was behind the goal square. Now, it wasn't technically behind. It's just that the goal sprite is being drawn after the player sprite creates the effect, as I mentioned earlier, of a Z layering, of things existing within a Z axis as perceived by the player. The goal is being drawn after the player, and so the goal appears in front of the player. As I demonstrated, when it collides, the player seems as if it is behind the goal square. Well, this is the end of the first video. In the second video, I will go over using images and using sprite lists to load numerous sprites and check the collision without writing extra conditional statements. Thanks for watching.